You're welcome. Representative <laughs> Yuakim, would you like to make a motion to move House File 725 before the committee to lay over for possible inclusion for further consideration at a later date? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to um, move that we bring before the committee House File 725 to be laid over for a future for, to future date or potential education bill. Representative Yukim, before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill in the shape you'd prefer. Could you please describe this author's amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I have the A2 amendment that makes some changes suggested by MDE and gets the bill in the shape that I would like to have it in. Members, uh, Representative Yukim has um, put the A2 before us. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor of adopting the A2, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Representative Yuakim, your bill is in the shape you prefer. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Currently, school districts can access the Extended Time Revenue Program to fund programming for students who are enrolled in school and participating in academic programming that is before or after school and is extended uh, in an extended week or summer school program or any other additional programming authorized by this year's um, this year's learning your program. Sorry, there's a lot of programs in there. <laughs> However, this does not apply to the school districts who provide the educational services and residential facilities. This means that schools cannot access this important revenue for services provided in our residential treatment programs. You will hear from our testifiers that students in these programs could particularly benefit from the educational opportunities and the broad curriculum currently available to their peers. Many of these students also need the extra time and attention to address learning loss. This gap in service first came to my attention when I became the education policy chair and toured the Hennepin County Home School. Intermediate District 287 facilitates the educational programming for students placed in this facility, and they weren't able to access the revenue stream to extend learning beyond the regular school day or school year, exacerbating the opportunity gap their students were facing. A student seeking treatment or who has been placed in one of our residential facilities should not face falling even further behind academically. House File 725 would allow all school districts, including our intermediate districts and cooperatives, to qualify for extended time revenue for every pupil placed in a residential facility or other facilities providing mental health services, juvenile justice services, or related programming. Members, there are multiple letters of support in your packet from NAMI and other a variety of providers. And I also have two testifiers here today that can paint an even better picture of why this bill is needed. But before that, I think, uh, that Ms. Andrines and Andrines, Adrian, sorry, has a fiscal note that's hot off the presses to walk us through. Ms. Adrian's. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Joachim. Um, we did just receive the fiscal note. And so I will quickly um, just give an account of what the costs are. Um, the, the amendment that was referenced um, staff has been working with the agency on the amendment, so uh, we are under the impression that the amendment should not have an impact on the fiscal note, that this is um, the current estimate of the cost of the bill. And what the fiscal note assumes is that um, all of the students who are currently enrolled in care and treatment programs um, by the end of the school year will participate in the summer program. And so the number of students, uh, the current total of that is about 1,700 students. And so the cost then um, for fiscal year 22 would be about $930,000. And then uh, starting in fiscal year 23 and ongoing, it would be just over $1 million. Uh, members, any questions on that? Not seeing any. I am going to move on to our testifiers. It looks like our first testifier with us today is Sandy Lewandowski, Superintendent of Intermediate School District 287. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning. My name is Sandra Lewandowski and I'm the Superintendent of Intermediate District 287. My school district provides educational services to 11 West Metro school districts and we are often responsible for some of the highest need learners in the state, including students in setting for special education, students attending area learning centers, and those um, students who receive an education while attending a care and treatment facility. 
Uh, my specific district provides education to care and treatment programs run by Alina, Headway, Hennepin County, Nexus, Prairie Care, Volunteers of America, and Paragon. And today I'm re representing all four of the intermediate school districts in the state. And I want to thank this committee for its focus on race equity, trauma, and student mental health. For many students in our programs, they are often impacted by all three of your priorities. Current statutory language for extended time revenue allows for districts to receive extra funding for learners who may benefit from additional instructional time up to an additional 20% of the formula allowance. For a district such as ours that serves very high need students in different kinds of settings, as those I have mentioned in area learning centers and care and treatment facilities, the, the current inequity is amplified for some of the student, highest need students in the state. The current statute showcases an unintentional patchwork of funding for some students, but not for others. As this committee amplifies the priorities of racial equity and mental health, it is important to point out an example. Specifically, the current statute allows for a school district that provides an educational instruction to two care and treatment programs in greater Minnesota, Prairie Lakes Education Center and Lake Park School in Wilmer. They have the ability to receive extra uh, revenue for um, extended time. However, students in other care and treatment programs in Minnesota, such as those served by my district and other intermediates, are not able to access this additional funding for a extended instructional time. And for students in our correctional facilities and residential mental health programs, they often come to us in crisis, deficient in credits, and or are involved in the juvenile justice programs. These students are disproportionately students of color in the juvenile justice programs. The inequity of the current situation could be, um, uh, the inequity of the current situation could be the following example. We could have a student attending an area learning center program in Plymouth, Minnesota, in our, in our district, and if that student gets discharged to go to a residential mental health facility, they would have extended revenue while in area learning center, but not when they go to a private residential uh, treatment facility. This simply seems untenable for the student who indeed is probably in crisis as is their family. Um, I would like to say, however, that there, there are many considerations in this bill, but the biggest consideration is that of equity for students across the state. I know that, that those of us who are responsible for those educational services would be grateful and the students would um, benefit tremendously. Members of the committee, we are trying to address these equities in everything you do and everything we do. Approval of House File 725 eliminates one such inequity, and I would urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewandowski. I see we have a question from Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to the testifier, thank you very much uh, for your work, and thank you for uh, supporting this bill. I I'm curious, uh, you had mentioned many of the services that you provide and what you've been familiar with. How much has the opioid uh, epidemic uh, I should say the opioid crisis contributed. Have you seen a, an increase in students? Um, have you seen that change at all? I, I'm curious about how much that chronic addiction um, uh, is, is prevalent in your students and the students you've seen. Ms. Lewandowski. Madam Chair, Representative Krisha, uh, we indeed uh, uh, see evidence Evidence of that, I don't have specific numbers, but for many of the kids in our programs, any of the programs, they are often um, involved with substance abuse. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so to the testifier, uh, I'll just ask it bluntly, if uh, we were to see an, in another drug introduced in the system, recreational cannabis, would you anticipate the funding here enough or would you be coming back asking for more because you could anticipate more students. Ms. Lewandowski. Madam Chair, Representative Krisha, um, what I know is that um, the trauma 
and mental health issues uh, that our students often have um, result in them using chemicals of all types and certainly uh, using cannabis is one of those. I don't um, necessarily have a firm um, opinion or way to address whether um, further legislation around the legalization of cannabis would increase that particular uh, phenomenon. Uh, we do have another testifier that we're Madam going Chair? to, uh, Representative Krisha. Yeah, thank you. I just, I, I follow up comment to the testifier and it would be unfair of me to ask you one way or the other, if you support or not, that's not my intent. I'm just trying to get to, uh, whether or not other issues are going to affect, uh, the educational budgets that are prevented in front of us and the programs that you're working with. Uh, again, it's not fair of me and I'm not trying to paint you. I'm just trying to understand what you see in front of you. And I think your answer was a very fair one that um, the chronic addiction uh, comes from mental and other trauma that's inflicted in the homes. I would hope that while we're a finance committee, we can't reduce those necessarily in the budget, but we can find programs uh, that do reduce those. I, I think the ultimate goal would be to make your job easier. Would that be a fair statement to the testifier? Ms. Lewandowski. Madam Chair, Representative Krisha, thank you. And um, uh, certainly if there are services that are, are um, well matched to adolescents particularly, uh, we would uh, very much welcome that. I think the uh, other distinction, however, that I would draw, if kids have access to adequate um, services to address their trauma, to address their mental health issues, and to address reasons why they might have gotten involved in the correctional facility, um, I would expect that over time, we would see that we wouldn't need as much money for those kind of services. Addressing the needs of our kids is a first priority, not just because it's what's right for kids, but because we spend money all the time for things that are, are um, interfering uh, with their lives. And uh, we need to spend more time, more money up front so that we avoid those more serious deep end issues later on in their life. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Ms. Lewandowski. Uh, Representative Thompson. I'm sorry, I, I was muted. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. My, uh, my apologies. We do, have, we do have another testifier I'd like to make sure we get to. So if you could make this brief, that would be wonderful. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so to the testifier, thank you very much. And what I was saying on mute uh, was there's a lot that we agree on and your work is very important. And the one thing that sticks out on me, and I think to, to keep in perspective is the more we focus on the kids, the more we can reduce the needs for these and absolutely uh, respect that. And just wanted to thank you for your work. This is a hard job. Thank you very much. Representative Thompson, do you still have your question? I think we should, for the sake of time, go, I can ask after the last testifier. I just had a quick comment, but I don't, I don't want, I want to go ahead and finish with it. Okay, we will move on to the next testifier and, and uh, please feel free to ask your questions then. Up next, we have Connie Ross, um, the Residential Programs Administrative Director from North Homes Children and Family Services. Welcome to our committee. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me. My name is Connie Ross and I'm the Director of our Residential Programs for North Home Children and Family Services. We provide residential treatment for children in Grand Rapids and Bemidji. I also serve on the board of Aspire Minnesota. My testimony today is made on behalf of all Minnesota's care and treatment in support of House File 725. The youth we care for are young boys and girls ages 10 to 18. As I'm sure you're aware, there's a growing children's mental health crisis in Minnesota. The need for care and treatment programs is critical. An estimated 109,000 children and youth in Minnesota need treatment for serious emotional disorders. The children we serve have serious complex mental health needs. They're unable to function safely in our communities and in our public school settings. These children present with suicide ideation, aggression, have been exposed to significant trauma, neglect, sexual and physical abuse, and failure to thrive in their homes and community settings. As a result of what I just described to you, these children have also experienced significant disruption in their education. 
Children served in care and treatment are often at least a half to an entire year behind in credits required to pass their existing grade or pursue graduation. We have had children in our care that are as much as two years behind in the required credits to graduate. This equates to just one more disappointment and failure in their young lives. Positively, while in a structured environment such as residential treatment, we can actively support them in meeting their educational goals. Our hope for each student is that they can transition back to their community um, setting and school and be at a grade level so that they can integrate back into school activities with their peers. An example to demonstrate my point of need is young Jack. Young Jack had multiple suicide attempts which resulted in six hospitalizations within the past year, placements in foster care and finally placement in residential treatment. As you can imagine, each hospitalization and placement interrupted Jack's educational experience. Jack grew gravely behind in school. This resulted in Jack simply giving up and not attending school. Prior to admitting into residential treatment, Jack had not been to school for the preceding entire year. Upon completion of residential programming, Jack had enough seat hours to be able to transfer back to his home school and allow him to be at his expected grade level. More importantly, Jack was so very proud of his accomplishments. He was able to demonstrate that he was clearly talented and could succeed in his education. Alternatively, during the summer when children admit to residential programs and we don't have an extended school time available to students, we see them fall behind. This is truly regrettable as we know that each could be using this time to not simply keep up on their education, but to make substantial educational gains. As care and treatment providers of intensive services for students, we are emphatically supportive of all opportunities to enrich their experiences. School is critical and collaboration with our local school districts is fundamental to delivering quality education to our students at this very critical time in their lives. We urge you to support HF 725 to assure all students can make the gains they need while in residential treatment. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you, Ms. Ross. I see uh, Representative Erickson has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. This question is for Ms. Ross. Proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Ms. Ross, I have a residential treatment center and if we were to be successful in getting extended time revenue used to address the needs of these um, uh, adjudicated young men in my facility, uh, what assurances do we have that the staff who will come from a school uh, in the area will be trained in how to deal with these students? Is, is there training that goes on to address the needs? Because some of these are, as I've heard you describe, uh, you know, high needs. And the staff who come into these facilities uh, actually come in uh, to a, uh, a very tentative situation that they're not always uh, acquainted with. So is there uh, staff development available for these uh, high school, uh, usually as high school and middle school staff who may provide the services? Ms. Ross. Madam Chair and Representative Erickson, thank you for the question. Um, in, within our residential programs, we do offer training to all school staff. Um, they're able to participate in the required training um, that our mental health practitioners and professionals um, participate in as well. Um, we really focus on um, giving them the tools to be able to effectively work with, de-escalate, understand trauma, um, so that they can effectively meet their needs. Um, you know, and quite often, um, these children's unique needs are embedded in their IEP. Um, and so they have access to their, obviously, IEPs, their diagnostic assessments. And then, of course, the care and treatment staff provide support to um, our teachers and school staff within our buildings as well. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ross, and thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Erickson, any follow-up? Okay, Representative Krisha. Representative Krisha, you're muted again. Boy, thank you very much. Um, uh, to the test for Ms. Ross, thank you for your work. And this question uh, is, as you look at the staff, and I've worked in one of these facilities. In fact, I worked in the facility that is in Representative Erickson's district. And uh, 
it, it's absolutely traumatizing what what these kids go through and and the roads to get them at least to to function. But my, one of the questions that I have is in these facilities, and I'm thinking back, and it hasn't been that long ago to the the diversity and the makeup. Um, how important and what efforts are you putting forward for uh, staff of color and diversity when you start to hire for these? And how important is that? And are there things that we shouldn't do to restrict your efforts to get good quality staff in? Because I know how very, very important those staff and those staff connections are to these uh, students. Ms. Ross. Madam Chair, Representative Kershaw, thank you for the question. Um, we agree um, that having staff of cultural diversity is imperative. Um, we um, certainly are, um, we, we rally to um, promote um, hiring staff of diversity um, and do so whenever we can. We have a very strong cultural component within our programs. Um, and so we understand that children need to work with staff like themselves. And so um, in regards to what can you do, um, I'm not sure. You know, in Grand Rapids, we, we tend to be rural. Um, and so our hiring pool is quite limited here. Um, we do things such as um, have incentives for employment within our agency. Um, however, it still continues to be a challenge. Representative Krisha? Yeah, and, and thank you for that, Ms. Ross. And so while th there's broad agreement on the diversity side, I just want to make sure, because you, you highlighted it, in, in certain rural areas where it's just difficult to get staff, we have to make sure we're not just putting restrictions for, for you to get good staff. And I, um, I, I think it's a, def a delicate balance, and, and thank you for answering that. Um, Representative Krisha, it looks like uh, Ms. Lewandowski would like to respond to the comment also. Ms. Lewandowski. Madam Chair, Representative Krisha, I would just like to add that one thing you and other legislators uh, could do is fully support mental health programming in the schools, co-located mental health programs. We know by research that when mental health is embedded in a co-located school kind of environment, the mental health has the potential to be six times more effective. And the, again, the earlier we can get to those mental health and trauma issues, the better. So secondly, um, in regard to trauma is providing a professional development um, and ongoing support to staff who are working with kids who have been um, involved with extreme trauma and sometimes can become very physically aggressive. We need to have safe environments for our staff. We have to have um, well-prepared teachers and educational assistants. Um, it is then that we can do the best job with the students while they're with us and not need deeper end programming. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you to the test fire. Thank you for your response. And what I would say to that is absolutely agree. I think we should focus on those. You always want to focus on the needs first. I think the challenge and what I'm, I'm wrestling with here is in our committees, we know what we need to go to first, uh, academic achievement, mental health, trauma. But unfortunately, we put all these other proposals out there and we end up nibbling away at the problem. Um, believe me, if I could, working in child protection and working with trauma and chronic addiction and homeless kids, if I could solve that for you first, I would uh, and fight off all of these other things. But unfortunately, we have the must-haves and then we have all the nice-to-haves and the nice-to-haves start to suck away from the must-haves. So thank you very much and absolutely support your work. Representative Thompson, um, if you would like to ask your question now, I don't see any other testifiers on our list. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm going to have it. I, well, I just make a comment real quick. Um, we spend a lot of money on incarceration instead of education when it comes to our kids. Uh, you, you think about it. The pipeline to the penitentiary is real. I know we did this first bill that a representative uh, Mary Murphy. Holes. There's like a lot of questions, but to be honest with you, these are all our kids. There's no such thing as, as somebody else's kids. These are all our kids, and we're debating the kids. We're debating children and, and, and money for the children. So when we think about like things that make sense, I hope that we like really like 
hammered down on what it is that's really important uh, because this is our future. And I'll say this over and over again to this committee. This is our future and we better invest wisely in our future. These kids are our future. You know, they, 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 they have these labels, these at-risk youth. They're at risk if we don't help them. They're at risk if we don't help them. If we have the power to help our kids. So let's start investing that. Every dollar we have to invest in these kids. Uh, we, we find money to you absolutely right. Uh, uh, Representative uh, Sandra Lewowski, Ms. Lewowski said that. We find money to do everything else. I mean, we have to debate on on, on things that make sense. And these kids make sense. Our children, education, financing their education and financing things outside of these schools uh, other than flooding these doggone schools with these kids who are going to come back to school. And, and, and this is not a tangent. This is the truth. The truth really don't need help. These kids need our help. So I hope we're thinking about our investments wisely because the payoff will be greater later. Or do we want to pay off? And I just want to put that on this in this space and, and, and thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Thompson. I see that uh, Ms. Lu Lewandowski would like to respond to that comment. Ms. Lewandowski. Repres Madam Chair, Representative Thompson, all of our kids are all of our kids. We don't treat them, we don't fund them, we don't provide for them equitably. That's my reality in the district I work in. And I would add that while funding is always short for the things we need in our society, I know that I spend over a million dollars on workman's comp bills that I would rather spend on mental health services and instructional needs. So we can exchange some of the things we're funding. It's just whether our intent, our desire, and our, our goal of racial equity is one that we want to work on. Thank you, Ms. Lewandowski. Uh, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for um, Ms. Lewandowski. I was really intrigued by what you said about making sure that we have mental health supports co-located within schools. Can you talk a little bit about which services in particular you think would be the best to co-locate within schools to adequately address student mental health? Ms. Lewandowski. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, I, I would appreciate that opportunity. What, what I see needed um, is that schools have morphed into quasi mental health providers. And that has really been amplified and, and articulated during this pandemic. We have kids, many, many kids who have a range of mental health, health issues. The schools are not prepared or funded to do that. I believe the time has come to pivot and intersect those two things that our legislature funds, mental health and educational services. It truly does not make sense that we need to send educational services into mental health facilities, but we don't necessarily provide the mental health services when they go back to education. Um, the, the, the services schools are pro, um, providing right now have not kept up with, the funding has not kept up with that. Our kids are losing. We still spend as much or more money when their needs get higher and higher and higher um, than it would take to put the services there to begin with. We could do this, the time is right to do this, and I'd be um, more than willing to help work on any such efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, Ms. Lewandowski. I think it's really, I think it's really important. I think you're talking a lot about how our needs are increasing, but the funding hasn't kept up. If I'm really synthesizing what you're saying, and that's something that this committee, as an education finance committee, really needs to look at. Are there any other? Um, is there anything else in terms of funding and policy that you think that this committee should really be examining to make um, your job and to make to make your job better and easier? I'm assuming this is for Ms. Lewandowski. Thank you. Ms. Lewandowski. Madam Chair, um, Representative Jordan, uh, indeed, <laughs> there are things. Um, I would go back to teacher and educational assistant training. We can't expect people coming out of a college prep program or from a different job if they're a, a, an educational assistant and walk into a facility where kids have significant mental health issues and have those staff be prepared to deal with that. 
So teacher, staff preparation, trauma training is the first thing I would say. And also um, attention to the, the safety needs of our staff. I have trouble getting staff when they're constantly injured. And I think that's plausible to understand from anyone in this committee. So we need to stabilize and have safe programs and well-prepared staff to address the student needs that are coming through the door. Our passion is there, but our training and our funding doesn't always keep up with it. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Jordan. No, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Lewandowski, for both your work and your words in this committee today. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Representative Thompson. Um, also happened to, um, also happened to be a member of this organization where we educate and inspire people that end racial injustice, uh, Fight for Justice, LLC. And I go into these facilities, uh, I speak to children who are locked up in these facilities uh, in particular. Um, one facility, the, 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 the guards there want me to key in on one particular child, and I'll be real quick, because he's so tough. His chest pups out when he, when he leaves out of the facility. And he's punking kids out of their lunch. And he's a problem child. He's probably so, you know, and when I walk in and I speak to the child and I ask you, well, why are you here? I'm, I'm here for stealing. And I said, no, you're not going home. They don't have a, a place where they keep you for stealing. You're here. And, and, and I find out um, this kid is here for molesting his sister. This is the truth. It's a true story. Molesting his sister. And I'm, I'm looking at the guards now and I'm looking at the people who want me to key in on this kid because he's not, he, he better not come out of that, he's in his, he's crying. And sometimes they see him on camera crying. And that's why he's crying. No, he's crying because he can't go home. He can't go home when he's old enough to go home and he'd be labeled, a, a, a right? So when I'm looking at the administrators and the people here and I'm saying to them, put this kid, give him a basketball. He's like six feet tall. Talk to him, you're, you're, you're his father. You're his, you're his, you're the only thing that is a role model. And what you give him is just uh, turn the key and lock the door, turn the key and lock the door. So there's, there's a need for culturally intelligent people in these buildings because this kid is not, he's not a, a, a bully. He's acting out because he's in a facility he's not familiar with, but he's also not going to be a punk in this facility. So he has to put on this, this, this act as if he's a tough guy, but when in that reality, he's crying on the inside way. And so when I left, I said, Mr. Thompson, now you're going to come back. Uh, and, I, and I talked to the director. And I, I didn't get a dime for this, by the way. I didn't ask for a dime. But yes, I'll be back because I need to come in and check on you. But I started writing the University of Minnesota about this kid because he's six feet tall in a facility where they treat him like he's a criminal. And he's there because somebody taught him this behavior in this house, by the way. This is something that was learned. I'm saying that when we, when we come and ask for money, let's ask for money for things that make sense and use the money for stuff that makes sense. You know, you know, I, you know I, have a, I have a 30 some year degree in being black. I don't have a bachelor's degree in being, I don't come with instructions. You know, this kid needs people who not only can, can understand him, but meet him on this level. And not just these, these people, these are human beings that we're talking about. These, these people just come in and turn the key and they lock the door and they unlock the door. They don't even understand this child. And I, I want you to understand that this is like, I'm just, I'm paying attention. It also seem like sometimes I'm preaching to the choir. These, this, these are real problems because we send these kids back to the community at some point. So while you have them, at least have people who can like get on their level and get to them and reach to them because that's all we have. You know, and so I guess what I'm saying is when you're asking for funding, at least use the money for things that you see that make sense. You know, you go and say, I need somebody with at least a bachelor's degree. How do you have a bachelor's in being black? How do you have a bachelor's in being culturally intelligent? How do you have a, how do you have a, you, there's, there's, you know, children don't come with instruction manuals. So I just want y'all to understand, like, I'm so serious about helping the community that needs help the most, because we spend a lot of money on incarceration and not enough on education. Thank you, Representative Thompson. I'm not sure if there was a question in there for one of our testifiers. And if there wasn't, uh, no, no, do any of the testifiers... Perfect. Uh, feel a need to respond or would like to respond? Madam Chair, I would please. Okay, Ms. Lewandowski. Um, 
Madam Chair, members of the committee, Representative Thompson, I could not agree with you more. I work in a school district um, as superintendent for the last 15 years. I see the pipeline to prison in real time with our six, seven, and eight-year-olds who are not getting their trauma and mental health needs met. Those needs don't go away if we don't address them and if we don't fund them and they continue as the youngster gets older and they awful, often and regrettably do end up just the way you described. I believe that's caused a great deal by our country's racism and lack of addressing trauma along with other issues, but those are two big ones that I see all the time. It's not right. We are not racially equitable. Our kids need better. And that's what we should be doing as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lewandowski. Representative Joachim, uh, any closing remarks? Oh, so many, but I will keep it brief. This is what happens when you have amazing people testifying and Superintendent Lewandowski and Director Ross who um, push us to have those conversations that we should be having in this committee. And I want to thank uh, Representative Jordan and Representative Thompson as well for that, and Representative Cresha and Representative Erickson. These are the kind of conversations I, I was hoping to have the last two years in education policy. And I, I want to thank Superintendent Lewandowski for all the work that they're doing in District 287 around trauma. Um, their school had are the ones that keyed me into the book that we read in education policy last two years ago around the boy who was raised as a dog and Dr. Bruce Perry's work and the work they're doing in training their staff on how to deal with trauma in students. And um, because that's what it's about. All that we're talking about right now is pre prevention. Layers and layers of prevention that we need to be investing in because as Representative Thompson said, they're all our kids and kids don't come with instruction manuals. That's what we always used to say in early childhood and family education as well. And that those layers are things like full service community schools that Representative Murphy brought forward. It's, um, it's my bill on para training to make sure that the folks in our schools have the education that they need to deal with kids that need that extra help. It's about this bill. It's about the extended time revenue so that we can take the opportunities for our students that are the most in need in our residential treatment facilities and our correctional facilities to do that extended time with them in the evenings and summer so that they don't get punished and miss out on their education because they're trying to get help. Um, we need to talk about layers, but we also need to talk about that there isn't a magic bullet. There's not just one thing that we can do. What we do know is that kids don't come in pieces. And as all the testifiers have said today too, kids walk into our doors in our education system with empty stomachs, with trauma, with not accessing healthcare, with no access to affordable housing, and all that prevention just an ounce of prevention is a pound of gain. If we cut to the root of the problem and start addressing students as they are as whole human beings, a lot of the money we're spending on the tail end in our justice system and in all other systems will be, will be decreased over time. And we have to stop talking from a framework of scarcity when we're talking about investing in our future. And I hope we can really put some money where our mouths are, because it's all fun to talk about, oh, this sounds great, or that sounds great, or, oh, that's just a want and not a need. No, all of this is need. Our kids are need. But I will bring us back to what we're really supposed to be talking about right now, but it all loops in together, is this bill. This bill about extended time revenue and access to it is about helping more kids. It's about preventative measures, and it's about giving hope for a future. Students that are in our residential facility and juvenile justice programs face many obstacles. Many obstacles. This bill can help take one of those obstacles away. Having access to educational opportunities can help them receive an education that will help them on the road to recovery and well, well into the future. So members, I ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Yuakim. And with that, Representative Yuakim renews her motion to lay over House File 725 as amended for possible inclusion for further consideration at a later date. 